And we remind everyone that we are recording this event. Please stay on mute. You may type in questions using the chat box and we'll address these during during or at the end of the presentation. We will also open the floor at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask your questions. And now for our speaker, Dr. Dave Kovacic has been a cardiologist with Franciscan Physician Network Indiana Heart Physicians since 1994. He graduated in, from Indiana University School of Medicine where he completed his residency and cardiology fellowship. He is board certified in cardiovascular disease, internal medicine, clinical lipidology, echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, and advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology. He is medical director of Indiana Heart Physicians Cardiac Risk Management Program, and he has a special interest in echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, and lipid management. Thank you, Dr. Kovacic. Uh, you can take it away. I appreciate it, Don. So um, I was tasked this evening to uh, talk a little bit about uh, lipids and to bring up some subjects that would be appropriate for a CME talk. Uh, so I came up with a, a talk that has three components. We'll talk about new agents, current guidelines, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the IHP lipid clinic, how it works, what you can expect out of it if one of your patients um, is involved with it. Um, we've had some great talks so far this year. Uh, Drs. Britson, Drs. Lalay, Dr. Rao all provided awesome talks. This won't be one of those, but at least we will get CME. Um, before I start, I just wanted to dedicate this talk to Eve Olson. Uh, I think for those of you who've been around for a while, you knew Eve. I met Eve um, when I joined back in the 90s. Uh, she was working in the ER at Beach Grove at that point. Um, she was a lot like Jerry Broperman, no matter how things were going, she was always positive, uh, always uplifting, uh, always helpful, no matter how busy she was. Uh, afterwards, she moved on to doing um, uh, medical weight loss management, worked a fair amount with Eileen Thomason. Uh, she just passed away recently. Um, I'm going to miss Eve. She was, she was awesome. Objectives uh, for this evening, uh, we're going to look at three uh, recently released lipid agents, um, one of which uh, you may already be using and one of which you may be using relatively soon. Um, we're going to look over the current guidelines for treatment of dyslipidemia in the United States, um, talk a little bit about the positive and negatives, and then we're going to do a quick review of what they consider to be the top 10 points. Um, and once I confuse you with that, we'll go over the IHP lipid clinic basic principles of care how we plug people in and how we titrate them and so forth. We'll take all questions at the end. So starting off with recently released agents, um, I'd like to talk about uh, pempidoc acid, which is also known as Nexlatol, and I'll be balancing in between brand names and generic names throughout. I think most people listening to this talk probably use the uh, brand names as opposed to generic names, but uh, being a CME program, I'll toss both of them out there. So bempedoic acid comes in monotherapy uh, and also comes in a combination with uh, Zetia or Zetamide. We'll also uh, follow up with uh, uh, Evanacumab, which is Evkiza, which is really a, a niche uh, orphan type drug. And we're gonna talk about a drug that we all may be using relatively soon if we figure it out, and that's in Clisran or Lecthio. So let's start with the one pill of the three. And that would be bempedoc acid, the Nexlatol, Nexlazet. Um, very important with branded drugs that we know the indications because payers are not going to uh, make the drugs available unless we meet those indications. So indication for bempedoc acid is an adjunct to diet and maximally tolerated statin therapy in subjects with atherosclerotic disease or heterozygous FH and being used to reduce LDL. Uh, outcome studies are underway and results should be uh, available in one to two years. Um, again, what is maximally tolerated statin therapy? Well, maybe max dose statin and maybe nothing if they can't tolerate statin therapy. So you'll see that phrase used a lot along the way. Everybody knows what atherosclerotic uh, heart disease is, um, but what is heterozygous FH? Well, it's an autosomal dominant disorder. Um, it is actually a little bit more common than we thought. So about one out of 220 to one out of 250 uh, Patients in the general population have heterozygous FH. Uh, mutation most commonly affects LDL, LDL receptors, but you can also have mutations involving ApoB particles 
or even uh, upregulation or, or increased activity of the PCSK9 protein um, diagnosed uh, by uh, either diagnostic criteria and or generic testing. There's multiple criteria out there. They're all different, uh, which confuses things even more because once again, if a payer is asking for uh, a diagnosis, they may use any one of these criteria and you'll have to go ahead and, and search it forward. Um, untreated in patients with heterozygous FH, the risk of cardiovascular disease is increased 10 to 20 fold. So it's very important to, to identify these, these patients. Um, and I always tell people, think heterozygous FH when you see an LDL greater than 160 milligrams per deciliter in children or greater than 190 milligrams per deciliter in adults. And in fact, US guidelines kind of focus just on, on using those LDL numbers, while some of the European uh, diagnostic criteria look at, at, at physical findings and, and, and often now, much more often genetic testing. Keep in mind that if you do genetic testing on somebody for heterozygous FH and you come up empty, they must have, they could easily have a, a mutation that has yet, not yet been identified. And those mutations are being identified on a monthly basis. Uh, also keep in mind that if someone has heterozygous FH, you should do cascade testing throughout the family to identify other family members who have those very high LDL levels uh, so that they can be treated, reduce their cardiovascular risk, and it also takes a, a, a role in family planning as well, obviously. You know, the internet's a great thing. And if you go searching hard enough, you can find a great picture. Simon Broom. So getting back to benpidoic acid, um, what's the mechanism of action? Well, it actually is very similar to a statin in that it, it uh, inhibits adenosine triphosphate citrate lyase to decrease overall cholesterol biosynthesis. This is just a couple steps upstream from where statins work. And so all that time we spent memorizing stuff in, in the medical school comes uh, back now. Um, as a result, LDL reduction is not additive. You're, you're working on the same pathway twice. So in lipidology, we talk about antagonistic interactions where you see less than expected. And this would be an example of an antagonistic uh, interaction. You can also have additive interactions. That would be, for example, uh, a statin plus Zetia, where the LDL reduction is actually additive for what you get from each one individually. And then, of course, what the Holy Grail is looking for the synergistic interaction where you get more than you'd expect by just adding the two together. Uh, in lipidology, we often re refer to those synergistic reactions as uh, double shock power. Very important if you're working with lipids. If you want just a one minute uh, video on double shock power and the importance of harnessing the energy, um, just look up Professor Donald King on double shock power on YouTube. It's just a minute long and it'll really educate you a lot about how we handle lipids. So illustrating where bempedoic acid uh, works, this is just looking at, at uh, cholesterol synthesis and you see it's only two steps away from where statins work. So again, it's kind of hitting the same hitting the same nail twice. Um, and for that reason, we don't see a great plasma LDL reduction. Dosing, pretty easy. It's a once a day drug. It's either 100 milligrams daily for Nexlitol the, the, and then 180 slash 10 if you're using Neclizet, which again is a combination with azitamide. It's with or without food. Uh, you can take it at the ta same time as taking a statin if you wish. There's no dosing adjustments for mild or moderate uh, liver disease or kidney disease. And like most of these agents, not studied in patients with severe liver or kidney disease. Um, you notice a little asterisk next to the statin there. Um, interestingly, there are some drug interactions to be aware of. LDL reduction, uh, when you're using it in addition to a statin, so somebody's able to take a statin. In monotherapy, it's giving you 15 to 18 uh, percent LDL reduction. That's actually less than any statin and less than azitamide. When you add it to azitamide as Neclizet, you'll get about a 35 percent. LDL reduction on top of what you achieved with statin therapy. Um, it's being used a little bit in patients who are statin intolerant. And, and you'll see that in monotherapy now you get a 20 to 25% because it's the only hammer hitting that nail in the cholesterol synthesis pathway. 
And in combination of azitamide and statin intolerant patients, you'll get about a 40% LDL reduction. Certainly nothing to sneeze at. That's that's what you get from, you know, a, a rosuvastatin 10 or torvastatin 20. Okay, so probably you can't see a slide really well, but the reason I put it in here is to show that there's no real uh, increase in myalgias when using um, bempedoic acid on top of statin therapy. Um, most likely because not too many people are using it yet and it hasn't gone through social media, uh, but at least for now, clean drug as far as myalgias are concerned. And again, we're seeing it used quite a bit in that population um, simply because that's, that's really all that we have available. Getting back to safety, um, this is kind of what, what has held up our lipid clinic and our group. Um, you shouldn't use it in combination of Prava greater than 40 milligrams or Simvastatin greater than 20 milligrams. And then somebody's going to say, wait a second, those are eliminated different pathways in the liver, and that's true. But there is an interaction uh, with the organic anion transporter protein, um, and, and that's what leads to a risk of myositis. So your, your amount of, uh, of circulating Prava or Simva is considerably higher when used in combination uh, with Nexlitol. And for that reason, um, you want to go ahead and limit your statin dosing uh, to those levels. Uh, secondly, it, it does raise uric acid levels. It's a little bit important for people who don't have a history of, of uh, gout, and it's really important for people who do have a history of gout. So it, it increases uh, incidence of gout to about 1.5% in general population on therapy versus 0.4% in the placebo group. But in those subjects who already had a history of gout, um, you're looking at 11.2% on therapy versus 1.7% in the placebo arm. So again, if somebody has a history of gout, this is going to increase their incidence of a recurrent event significantly. Um, that has held us up a little bit, but it's really the bottom bullet point there that really has given us a little bit of pause. And that has to do with tendon rupture. Uh, this is in the PI and basically states that uh, on therapy, there was a 0.5% incidence of tendon rupture. This could be anything from a tendon in your finger to an Achilles tendon to something in your knee, something in your shoulder. And there was 0% in the control arm. Uh, I actually took this to a group and we discussed it. We thought for the degree of LDL reduction and the risk involved, especially after as a, as a group, we had had that talk about um, tendon ruptures and with antibiotic therapy with the quinolones. Um, we decided to kind of hold back as opposed to, to using bempedoic acid freely in our clinic. Uh, there was a, um, a paper published that tried to allay the fears of, of uh, those like me uh, by Harold Bays out of Louisville um, that tried to explain away some of these. And, and he may be correct, but um, I'm going to wait for the outcomes trials to come out and see what the tendon issues are there. Uh, before I make a strong decision on what to do about uh, the use of bempedoic acid in our clinic. So we're going to move from a pill to an infusion in a very specific population. And this is uh, Evanacumab, which is also uh, called Evkiza. And for those of you who haven't seen or heard about it, it's because currently indication is just an adjunct to other LDL lowering therapies uh, for patients 12 and older who have homozygous FH. Um, because it's a relatively small group of people, will likely never have outcomes. I do believe uh, that this agent um, may uh, look for expansion into the heterozygous FH uh, subset in the not too distant future. So what is homozygous uh, female uh, hypercholesterolemia? Well, historically, we said that anybody who runs around with an LDL greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter has homozygous FH. And historically, the incidence has been about one out of a million. So we used to say that we had 300 or 350 of these patients in the United States. Um, the criteria has been revised several times, a lot more now doing genetic testing. Um, and the thought process is maybe there's three or more Per million people. Again, you, you might be talking about 1,300 to 1,500 patients in, in the entire country. And again, genetic testing is playing a bigger role in identifying these people. It's not hard to identify them. Uh, clinically, you'll see xanthomas, you know, before the age of 10, and uh, many of them will infarct or stroke before the age of 20. Um, 
the best way to really pick them up is, is that uh, most commonly they have two heterozygous uh, parents. And so if you know that they're heterozygous, or, or at least there's a family history of very high cholesterol levels, you're going to keep an eye out for this. I don't know how many pediatricians we have on board, but if there's a family hi history of premature coronary disease or family history of very high cholesterol levels, recommendation for children is to start testing at the age of two. I've had children of my patients start statin therapy at the age of seven. And it's been a while, but uh, just to remind you on the left side of the screen, they're looking at, at how heterozygous FH works. You have an autosomal dominant uh, mutation that uh, if any child gets it, it's going to go ahead and, and manifest itself. Um, but thankfully, not everybody gets it. Uh, when you look at homozygous uh, FH on the other side of the slide, on the right-hand side of the slide, it, you start off with two heterozygotes. And unfortunately, uh, grandma and grandpa give it to the father there to the, to the far right. And of course, he's going to go ahead and pass it along to every child um, along the way. And it's that father who's going to be at super high risk for developing vascular disease at a very early age. And again, that, that this is manifests some of the importance of doing cascade testing in heterozygotes uh, to try to identify people and, and in advance try to stop any of this from taking place. So getting back to Evanacumab, it's a monoclonal antibody. And, and so, you know, we're, we're using those now. Uh, more in cardiology than ever. And we've been using monoclonals as a PCSK9 inhibitors now for years. But it's a little bit different. In fact, it's an infusion. And so this isn't something that patients can give themselves. This is given at an infusion center. It's given every four weeks. It's going to target angiopoietin-like 3, which is a protein that we'll look at in a second. Uh, angiopoietin-like 3 inhibits a couple enzymes in the body uh, that uh, are responsible for modifying very low LDL. And by using the monoclonal antibody, we actually activate uh, lipoprotein lipase and endothelial lipase to create more VLDL remnants. And we can clear those in homozygous FH patients. We can't clear the LDL almost always because they have bad receptors or no receptors, um, but we can clear those VLDL remnants. So what we're really trying to do here is push the body to make more VLDL remnants and less LDL. And the way we do that is by activating lipoprotein lipase and endothelial lipase. And we do that by inhibiting angiopoietin like 3. I don't know who came up with this, but they thought a long time about how to pull this off. So this is normal LDL production clearance through the LDL receptor. And so what you see is the, the liver shoots out some LDL, uh, and then uh, it will be partially degraded into VLDL remnants, and some of those are taken up by the receptors at the, at the liver. And then it can be actually chewed up a little bit more into LDL, and you see there at the liver, we have a whole bunch of LDL receptors just wait and gobble them up. So that's when things are good and normal. However, uh, you can run into a situation where um, your VLDL comes out, and, and it, again, it's somewhat uh, somewhat chewed up by uh, lipoprotein lipase and endothelial lipase, and you have some VLDL remnants which are being taken up by the receptors. But you also have LDL being made, and there are no receptors or very few receptors or malfunctioning receptors that pick it up. So the plasma half-life of LDL goes sky high. That gives it more time to get into our arteries. And so the whole process is that we're not going to be able to fix that LDL receptor. We want to go ahead and get more of these of these VLDL remnants taken up before they become LDL. And so what we do is we go ahead and give uh, evanacumab, and it in turn uh, inhibits angiopoietin like 3. And so we have more activity by lipoprotein lipase, more activity by endothelial lipase, which means more LDL remnants heading towards receptors, less LDL stuck behind. So we're not fixing anything at the liver. We're just delivering a different, uh, a different uh, molecule to the liver that's able to pick up. And again, um, pretty amazing somebody actually even thought this up. Most lipidologists uh, in the Midwest are shocked that this actually works, but it does. And it actually works really well. And so you're talking about nearly a 50% LDL reduction 
uh, versus the placebo in the homozygous stuff age patients. And that is a huge decrease and, uh, in those patients. And as you see, as opposed to a, a plasma apheresis where you see a big spike in valley every time you go ahead and put them through therapy, um, things stay pretty constant. Those LDL levels stay conservative lower uh, all the way throughout treatment. So in the past, 10 years ago, for homozygous FH, uh, really we we're using a whole bunch of plasma apheresis. Uh, since then, we've gotten away from it somewhat, um, and this is a great way to do it. You say, well, geez, but I have to sit in an infusion center to have it done every four weeks. It's a lot better than going through apheresis where we basically dialyze it off every two to three weeks. So it's definitely an improvement for that patient population, and perhaps one day it'll be open to other patients as well. So as all monoclonal antibodies go, it has excellent safety. Um, this monoclonal, um, again, it's an infusion. Uh, we don't really see any, any safety patterns or safety signals come out of it that are out of the ordinary. So safe way to do it. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the third agent now. Uh, and this is an agent that, again, a, a new mechanism uh, as far as mechanism of action and also something that, that we may be using um, in our clinics in the not too distant future, and that's Lecvio or Enclycerin. So this is a, an adjunct to diet and maximally tolerated statin therapy treatment for adults with heterozygous FH or uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease who require additional lowering. Um, the outcomes trials are underway, and again, we should have those probably in a couple of years. Um, there's no contraindication unless you already had allergy to, allergy to the drug when it was uh, being used in clinical trials. And we'll talk about uh, adverse events, but the bottom line is, uh, compared to placebo, the, the one adverse event that sticks out is that you have a higher um, injection site reaction rate with this agent uh, than you have with the monoclonals. Um, and aside from that, everything else is within about 1% of placebo. So well tolerated, just a few more hotspots where you where it's given. So this is again uh, for cardiology and, and in medicine a, a great new way of delivering uh, 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 your product. It's a small interfering RNA mechanism of action. So uh, specifically works in the liver um, and it's going to go ahead get to the cytoplasm and it is going to target PCSK9 mRNA. Uh, and degrade it. Uh, and so, you know, we, we use the PCA scan inhibitors to bind it up, uh, but this is different. We're going to go ahead and trash it before it even becomes an issue. And the amazing thing is, is that it's, it's uh, plasma levels that decline within 24 hours, basically undetectable within 48 hours. It just basically isolates in the liver, and that's where it does its duty. So, um, in clisran, again, novel mechanism of action in cardiology. Um, I wasn't big on the, the name in clisran. It turn, you know, basically turns off that, that uh, PSSK9 mRNA. So I recommended they call it Sirenoff, but they passed. The beauty with this agent is once you get it up and running, it is two doses a year. Uh, and what I mean by that is there's an initial dose, and then at three months, you go ahead and take a second dose. And after that second dose, it's every six months after that. And so once you got to get the ball rolling, it's two doses per year. Um, unfortunately, um, although it's, it's just a sub-Q injection, this is not a sub-Q injection that can be given by the patient. It has to be given by a healthcare provider. Uh, so it isn't something that we can mail to their house as we often do, or they can pick up at a pharmacy. This is something that, um, that they're gonna have to be given by a healthcare provider. And there's a, there's a reason for that coming up shortly. Um, like uh, many of our agents, injectable agents not for cholesterol, there's no adjust dose adjustments for uh, mild, moderate, even severe renal impairment or mild to moderate hepatic impairment. Um, no drug to drug interactions. And that's another beauty of these injectables is that we're not running into the drug and drug in interactions that we still have with our oral agents and we still look for on a monthly basis in our lip clinic. Um, Miss a dose, no problem. If you're within three months of, of the planned dose, just keep on going to original schedule. If you're over three months off, you just kind of kickstart it from scratch and get going again. 
And it's pretty effective for something that's given on an every six month basis. Um, when you look at the at the difference from placebo um, a year or two out, you know, is a 52 percent LDL reduction. So you're getting over 50 percent LDL reduction with two shots a year. Um, with the uh, injectables of PCSK9 inhibitors, we get a little bit more than that, somewhere between 55 and 65 uh, percent. Remember, these are these were all d different trials that were done, so you really can't make that comparison. I suspect that in glycerin will come out just a few percent lower as far as the LDL reduction, uh, with the ease of use being the uh, one of the main sellers of the drug. Interestingly, unlike the PCSK9s, it does have a little bit of effect on, on other uh, lipid parameters, uh, including triglycerides uh, and HDLs you see there. Whether that's going to have any clinical value or not uh, remains to be seen. It's still an LDL story um, as far as we're concerned. I mentioned safety a little bit earlier. Uh, injection site reactions, 8.2% of glycerin versus 1.8% of the placebo arm. Uh, normally, with the PCSK9s, it was only about a 1% increase. Uh, compared to the placebo arm, but all of the side effects are within one percent of of uh, each other, meaning that there's really not any other safety issue or adverse event issue that pops up other than those injection site reactions to date. I do want to mention one more thing on inclisran. Uh, one might say, well, why aren't you guys using that? Uh, it's a buy-in bill, and so uh, this is something that's purchased either by an infusion center or purchased by our system uh, and then administered and then you bill for that. Um, it's kind of a tough time uh, when we're kind of short on manpower to set up a system where you're not gonna miss uh, any of these doses, you're not gonna miss bill things because if you miss bill uh, this agent, you're gonna end up buying it yourself and giving it away for free. The bigger issue is that as a buy-in bill, um, it doesn't come under uh, Part D. It actually comes under a medical expense. And I think there's a concern about ACO patients and whether this is going to be a medical expense for ACO patients and eat up a big part of, uh, of what uh, the system is paid each year for those ACO patients. So corporate is now looking at this. Um, our lipid clinic has been told to kind of uh, not start the drug until they have a better handle uh, how this will affect ACO patients in particular. Um, around the country, there's been similar concerns. There's been a slow start, like all new launches. But I do think it has a great promise. I do think that the outcomes will be important. Uh, but I suspect that down the road, in glycerin will be used extensively. You say, why is that? The PCSK9s are a little bit stronger, perhaps. Because with the buy-in bill, as long as you have the correct diagnosis, which you already established was ask atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or heterozygous FH, there's no PA, there's no approval process, it's covered. And so with that said, uh, we really struggle sometimes to get our injectable agents, our injectable P6K9s to our Medicare population. This would make that much, much simpler. And so we're hoping that we'll have this available shortly as a tool to use in that patient population. All right, moving on to the guidelines. And we're going to go this really quickly because even though it's partial redemption, um, they're still not very good and they do not reflect uh, what most lipidologists do, including the people who signed on to these guidelines in 2018. So when I say partial redemption, what I really mean is that the 2013 guidelines were so awful um, that they really probably couldn't do worse. So if for those of you who were practicing at the time, in 2013, ACCHA came out with cholesterol guidelines as opposed to the adult treat, treatment panel, which had done all the previous guidelines for the United States. Um, and it, we've always used targets, target LDLs. Target LDLs make it simpler for caregivers to know what they're trying to uh, uh, reach. And just as importantly, the patients understood what you were trying to do. So just like a blood pressure reading or an A1C, patients understood that you were targeting an LDL down to a certain number. So everybody was participating. When they removed that, um, then the patients had no idea. And frankly, most of the rest of us didn't have any idea either. They started talking about 50% off the baseline. If somebody had been on statin for five or 10 years, nobody knew what that baseline was. And in addition, in that time frame, 
we also went from paper and an older EMR to EPIC. So there was no way of getting that stuff back in many in in in, in many ways. So um, it confused everybody as far as what we were really trying to accomplish. Um, they actually ran those 2013 guidelines by many of our U.S. lipidologists who canned them, and they they put them through anyway. They ignored the concept of lower is better, which we'll talk about in a little bit. They undertreated the highest risk patients. So the people who really suffered the most by these guidelines were those who were at highest risk for having recurrent events or having a first event. Um, incredibly, they did not reflect the, the clinical practice of those signing off on these. In other words, um, as we go through the, the 10 points on these guidelines here shortly, the people who wrote these and, and published them, they don't follow them. And they'll be very open in telling you they don't follow them, but they felt that they had to follow the clinical trials that were done 25, 35, 45 years ago, and that's how they constructed these, these guidelines. And then bottom, they were the worst guidelines ever. And you say, boy, that's pretty harsh. Well, perhaps, but I wasn't the only one. So Cleveland Clinic uh, came out with a paper on the new guidelines, uh, worth the wait. And if you read that paper, clearly not. And so they came out early in 2014 and said, we will not follow these guidelines in any of our clinics. And they were quickly joined by the Mayo Clinic who uh, had their critical assessment of the guidelines and, and, this, and already started filling in the gaps of care because it became apparent that a lot of people would be undertreated um, and the highest risk patients would be undertreated. So the 2013 guidelines only lasted five years, which is a very short time for guidelines. The previous guidelines had lasted 12 years. Uh, and the reason was that I think everybody realized that we had to get back to something that was at least somewhat more sane. So they put 10 take-home messages. I'm gonna go, and I think many of you are familiar with these, but I'll shoot through them pretty quick. Uh, emphasize heart healthy lifestyle across the, the life course. And this starts, you know, childhood and, and goes forward. Um, and it is really important for patients to go ahead and understand the benefits of making good choices. Um, South side, um, we struggle at times with this. Uh, they struggle with it everywhere. So uh, never forget, you, you can't, fix LDL with exercise. You can partially help LDL with diet, realizing that 70, 75% of LDL in your body is made by your body and you're not gonna have any control over that. Um, but clearly, um, you know, we, we need to emphasize uh, a healthy lifestyle. The second thing they came up with is patients have recognized vascular disease, LDL is a target of therapy, and they want you to use a high intensity statin or of course the maximally tolerated statin therapy. And what they're aiming for here is an LDL reduction by 50% or greater. Now we know that's not enough for a lot of patients. If their LDL starts at 200 and they have vascular disease, you're not getting them nearly to where they need to be. And we'll see that in a second, but at least it was a start. And so they really wanted patients on high, basically on, on high intensity statin therapy. So what is high intensity statin therapy? Well, the definition is any statin dose that will drop uh, LDL by at least 50%. And they named the torvastatin, which is Lipitor, 40 and 80, and Rosuvastatin, Crestor, 20 and 40. The problem is the torvastatin, 40, really doesn't do it. Um, so really, you're, you're nailed down to a torvastatin, 80, or Rosuvastatin, Crestor, 20 and 40. So you have three choices of what you're supposed to be able to use. Um, not realistic. They they is specifically kind of stayed away from combination therapy as well. So what is moderate intensity, uh, intensity statin therapy? Well, I'm not going to read all these off, but it's either very low dose uh, Lipitor or Crestor, that's a statin or statin, and then the rest of the statins at varying doses. And the definition of moderate intensity is something that drops LDL by 30 to 50%. Okay. So when you look at the guidelines, they talk about high intensity, moderate intensity, they're breaking the groups, the, the, the statins down into these two groups. The problem is, is that when you look at both secondary prevention and primary prevention trials, where you're going ahead and uh, marching out LDL achieved versus events, lower is better. And 
even before we had the PCSK9 inhibitors, so even before that, uh, we saw that getting an LDL down into the 50s was better than leaving it in the six to high 60s, and that was the IMPROVE IT trial. So um, we already knew that lower is better. We knew that the, the, the trials that achieved greatest uh, benefit were the, the trials using the stronger statins in any population. Primary prevention, secondary prevention didn't really make a difference. Um, we knew that a medium intensity statin, namely PRAVA, had been studied against a high intensity statin, uh, namely Atorv or Lipitor, and the, 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 the outcomes were favoring the Lipitor, the Atorv statin group. It wasn't close. We also know that low dose versus high dose of torvastatin has been studied. And it also showed that the higher dose was better. So lower is better, and using a stronger drug, statin, will give you a greater event reduction. And that's been very crystal clear for quite some time. And in fact, now, if you were to extend these lines off based on the PCSK9 inhibitors, you can realistically say if you have somebody's LDL at 25, they have a lower event rate than they do at 50. And it's true without any safety issues that can be identified. So we're still stuck with them looking at 40-year-old trials, and that's what leads to the rest of our guidelines. So they talk about in very high-risk atherosclerotic disease patients, an LDL threshold of 70. So now they came back to the numbers. Uh, is something to consider in, in adding non-statins? That would be azitamide or the PSSK9 inhibitors. So they finally came out and said, hey, listen, if you have a really high-risk population, we're just kidding about the 50%, get them below 70. And for those of you who think that 70 is really low, keep in mind that uh, the diabetic guidelines for highest-risk patients look at 55, and in Europe for the highest-risk patients, they're targeting 40. So 70 is actually uh, the least aggressive goal that you have among most guidelines out there. They looked at, at patients with heterozygous FH. And so they were basically identifying them um, as having LDLs greater than 190, which I mentioned earlier. You don't need to calculate out a 10-year risk. Um, you can just go ahead and start treating, trying to get their LDL down below 100, starting with statin therapy, adding a zitamibe or a PCSK9 if necessary. Um, I think many of you uh, have the risk calculator on your phone. Uh, you can get that through the ACC or AHA website. And the calculator is nice. The one I would set up is the one that gives you uh, both 10-year risk and lifetime risk. Um, I think that if you're really trying to make a point, the lifetime risk is something better to throw out there. Um, so, so having that available for patients, I think is super useful um, to kind of let them know where things are. They may feel good now, but they're not going to down the road. Keep in mind as well that in young people, the 10-year risk is always very low because age carries the biggest part of that. But once a guy hits the age of 60, no matter how pristine his numbers are, he's usually going to be at least a candidate for statin therapy. In patients age 40 to 75 with diabetes and an elder greater than 70, start moderate intensity statin therapy without calculating risk. Why moderate when we know it's not as good as high intensity statin therapy? Because the clinical trials that were done 30 years ago used PRAVA and SIMVA in this population. And so that's why I went back to it. So to, to add the high intensity statin therapy, they would want rosuvastatin and atorvastatin to redo the trials with their drugs instead, which clearly isn't going to happen. And they also talk about diabetics at high risk, which is really all diabetics. Um, that's reasonable to use a high intensity statin to get at least a 50% LDL reduction. So um, I, I haven't seen a low risk diabetic. So we, we treat all of them pretty aggressively in our clinic, and we'll see that in a few minutes. How about adults 40, 75 uh, evaluated for uh, primary prevention? Uh, they always want you to have the, the discussion with the patients about the pros and cons, looking at other risk factors, um, benefits of lifestyle and statin therapies, potential for uh, adverse effects and, and drug-drug interactions, consideration of cost of statin therapy, which would be less than a Coke, um, and uh, the shared decision-making, which we're using now. Um, so. Uh, certainly a role for this. Um, again, um, I think that, that a lot of patients we identify as having multiple risk factors on top of their uh, on top of their 10-year risk. Um, so 
in, in this situation, this, this is the population that's hardest to nail down. And you can decide yourself if you want to be aggressive or not. I do want to just make a quick point about adverse effects of statins. In clinical trials where you do not know if they're taking a statin or not, the incidence of myalgia is 2%. It's a real entity, but it's 2%. In our clinic, it's over 20% of patients that either complain of taking a statin or can't take at least one statin. Three trials have been done where they took statin intolerant patients and uh, randomized the placebo or statin without telling them what they were taking. And it was basically a scattergram. And the conclusion of all three trials is that statins, for the most part, don't cause myalgias. But people actually think they do. And as long as they think they're taking a statin, a lot of people are going to complain. How to get around that is difficult. And a lot of times we end up using injectable agents of people that clearly could take a statin. They just refuse to. Moving on, about the age 40 to 75 without diabetes and LDL, grade, LDL levels greater than 70 with a 10-year risk of 7.5% or greater. They talk about using a moderate intensity statin therapy because, again, that's what the trials used, although everybody agrees, including people who wrote the document, that high-intensity statin therapy would help them more. You can always use calcium uh, RV, uh, uh, scoring. Um, Dr. Daly and, and Dr. Lale are two experts on that. Um, and that actually does help sometimes figure out how aggressive or non-aggressive you want to be. Keep in mind that if somebody has a, a, a zero calcium score, but they're diabetic or a smoker, um, that's not a get out of jail card. They're still at risk and you're going to treat their lipids if their risk uh, uh, dictates so. Beating this into the ground, that 40 to 75 age group, 10-year risk gets higher now, above 75 up to 19.9. Again, you look at some of the risk factors involved, family history, metabolic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, so GFR under 60, uh, premature menopause or preeclampsia history, uh, high-risk ethnic groups. They put South Asian, but let's face it, you could pull a whole bunch of different ethnic groups and put them on there. Um, high triglycerides. Why do you use 175? I'm not sure, because 150 is what historically has been used. And again, if you're trying to figure out uh, uh, risk-enhancing factors and, uh, to look for initiation of statin therapy, ApoB levels are elevated, elevated C-reactive protein indicating a, a high inflammatory state, uh, an abnormal ABI, uh, a lipoprotein, uh, L, I'm sorry, LP little a greater than 50. Um, uh, and again, these might push you towards being more aggressive. And once again, that age group. Um, you can use uh, calcium scoring to really help you out. And again, um, we, we use it a little bit differently than they do here, um, but calcium scoring is super useful uh, to help patients know if they have subclinical disease. It's hard to just use a number, though, because the age and gender of the patient really determines how important that number really is. In fact, that could be a great talk from Dr. Daly. So, um, Bottom line is uh, you, you want to go ahead, once you treat, assess adherence, because 50% of Medicare patients fall off their statin without telling their caregivers within 12 uh, months, uh, and you're going to go ahead and follow them up with lab work as needed. Um, bottom line is uh, you really have to keep an eye to make sure people are taking their meds, because often they fall off of them. Now, if you want that all in two pages, um, you can pull up on any website. This is a primary prevention uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, looks super complicated. We simplify it in our clinic quite a bit. My feeling is if somebody has a 10-year risk greater than 7.5%, I consider them to be a good candidate for statin therapy. Uh, and if they have any other risk factors that add to that, I'll even be more aggressive. And looking at the patients who have uh, known vascular disease, um, it's amazing. They break them into a very high risk or not very high risk. And I'm not sure there's too many people with coronary disease or peripheral vascular disease. I'd say, hey, you're not very high risk. Um, we know that the degree of stenosis, the degree of disease does not have anything to do with the risk of having event. Um, plaque rupture is not related to degree of stenosis. So um, how they came to this, I'm not sure. But um, if you're taking the boards, these are the correct answers. If you're really wondering what really high risk is, 
uh, there's two tables to keep in mind. If somebody has two of these major events, so recent ACS, history of MI, MI other than the recent AV, ACS, meaning two events, history of ischemic stroke or symptomatic peripheral uh, artery disease, um, if you have two of these, you're considered very high risk. And we have some of those, but we have a whole bunch more of one of these and two of these. And these are the high-risk conditions. So if you're Medicare age, heterozygous FH, history of intervention, diabetes, hypertension, um, a GFR under 60, smoker, um, persistently elevated LDL, history of congestive heart failure, then all of a sudden, uh, a lot more people fall into the very high-risk group. So again, there's a lot more out there than perhaps they think. And just to remind you, lower is better. So um, the NLA, National Lipid Association, came in 2014 to Indianapolis, um, and I attended. And two of the people who have written the last two set of guidelines were there. And offline, I asked them if they really were using moderate intensity statins. And I did say no, but they're almost doing combination in all of their people they see, which are mostly VIPs. I mean, that's who they're going to be seeing. But they're not using any of the moderate intensity statin therapy that they advocate in the guideline. So take that. All right, so now to the lipid clinic. Uh, there's some positives and negatives about the clinic. Created in 97, it was a brainchild of Dr. George Ravtek, also known as Reverend Tyak on the south side of Indianapolis. And this was designed to have patients seen in clinic. It became clear that we would need a whole new building to do that. And also people didn't appreciate another copay for what they thought should have been handled the first time around. So now it's a virtual clinic. We don't see people. We see consults if you want to see consults, but we don't see people who are just in the clinic. Uh, it's designed as a forced titration system. So we're going to drive people to goal, our goals, um, as long as they allow us to. We have data entry personnel. We have some medication algorithms, and we use EMR to forward our care. Um, it, it potentially involves all patients who are going to be chronically cared for by an, an IHP provider. It doesn't really work out that way. We'll get to that in a second. It's free to patients. And so it's nice that you have people calling them and following up or trying to figure out what's wrong. Um, when people call our office with a complaint of myalgia, which happens like every four minutes, uh, they actually get to talk to somebody in the lipid clinics. So they're not just being pawned off to anybody. So it is a nice perk for the patients. It really provides better care. We have a lot more people to go now than we ever did before. Um, I want to make it clear, we're sharing the responsibility of other providers. So if if you have a patient that that in your office and they also see an IHP provider and they're in the clinic, that doesn't mean you can't adjust or increase or do whatever you want. Um, this was meant as a, as a tag team effort as opposed to us just assuming care. And one nice thing about the, the EMR is that we're act actively seeking out drug-drug interactions. Those normally have to do a simvastatin, but they also have to do a gemfriprazole. And so, um, unfortunately, our, our EPIC doesn't pick up some of the fibrate interactions and the fibrate issues with low renal function that really need to be addressed. So we go searching for them. Hopefully, I'm hoping by the end of this year, um, we're going to have David Cordwin working, I mean, by you know, watching David Cordwin work, uh, that we can actually improve um, EPIC's ability to pick up some of those potential interactions and, and safety issues. There's some negatives to the clinic that we, we, we deal with. Some patients don't, don't want to be treated, um, and some patients don't want to be titrated. So they may be on Prava 20, they've been on it for a while, and they just don't want to be budged. Um, especially recently, we struggle with manpower to actually run the clinic. And so we're, we're, we're one short staffing right now, um, but we've been a lot shorter than that in the past, which puts us behind and, and we don't get to the, to the, to the patients very quickly. Uh, we don't only really have the correct meds available, meaning that for our Medicare population, uh, for branded products, a lot of times we really struggle getting those agents. In fact, I know some of you uh, that might be listening tonight send your patients to us just because you couldn't get it either. You couldn't get them the drugs. And so we try to get them through the clinic. We have one lady who's just wonderful. A man is able to navigate the system better than most, but sometimes we just don't get what we need. The different EMRs don't play well together. So people have blood work done in another system. Trying to track down the blood work is just as hard as it was in 1997. 
And we've never really figured out how to handle diabetic population. And what I mean by that is they're super high risk, um, but they're also having a lot of lab work done by endo. We don't want to double up on the lab work and have added expense, um, but sometimes we just cross wires as far as how to get that done on a timely basis. So uh, that's a work in progress. It's only been 25 years, so we're working on it. So what are the basic principles of the clinic? Um, whatever we do has to be simple to follow. We're not going to have complex pathways like the ones we just looked at. It has to be simple and to the point. It has to be nimble. So you have to be able to change with new data or change with new pricing of agents. If something was very hard to get and becomes generic and very easy to get, we need to incorporate that into what we're doing quickly. So unlike the guidelines that change every five to 12 years, we can change on a dime. We're aiming for value. Uh, and what I mean by that is we're looking for good outcomes by reducing LDL in a cost-effective way. We're not giving everybody everything. Um, we're trying to get their LDL down as low as we can in a cost-effective fashion. Um, we're using target LDLs, not percentages, because every lipid in the clinic in the country uses LDL and not percentages. And remember, anyone can titrate up at any time, so it's not just going through the clinic. So if you have somebody in front of you in your office and you look at their LDL and it's too high, and you know that they're somehow involved in our clinic, but we haven't gotten them there, uh, definitely take a shot at it. So what are those simple guidelines we use? So we have a group of patients that we target an LDL below 70. Who are those patients? Coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, diabetics, uh, both uh, one and two, and uh, calcium scores greater than 100. Now you say, well, you can make an argument about type one diabetics, you can make an argument about well, who, that calcium score, what population you're looking at. But again, we can't have these endless algorithms. We want to keep it simple and to the point. Um, I will say that, again, I've already noted that the CAD, PVD, the risk of having an event is not reflected on the degree of stenosis. There was a trial called the East-West trial uh, done many years ago that showed uh, type 2 diabetics without a cardiac history were just as likely to have an MI as non-diabetics who already had infarcted. So we, we treat the diabetics as what's, what used to be termed a risk equivalent. And again, we needed to find a score that we all agreed on on calcium scores, and 100 seemed something that we could all remember. How about targeting 100? Well, the heterozygous FH, without known vascular disease, just like the guidelines say we're using 100, if someone has a calcium score between 20 and 100, we're targeting that population as well. And we're also targeting the 10-year risk without any established vascular disease to get them down below 100. And again, you know, we, we definitely have the, the, the uh, shared decision-making, but we don't have, we're not sitting there and measuring 10 different things and drawing uh, LP little a's or CRPs to, to, to try to tease that out. So we, we keep it simple and to the point. I think that if most people heard that their risk of having a stroke and heart attack and in, in the next 10 years was over 7.5%, they'd be willing to listen as to, you know, what can be done to reduce that risk. Order of therapy for LDL reduction, very clear. Atorvastat always first, followed by Rosuvastat. Why? Because those are the drugs that have the best clinical outcomes. We use Atorvastat first because amazingly, some uh, payers still demand that Atorvastat be used first. Uh, and then finally, Atorvastat is safe in our renal insufficiency patients. That's always something to keep in mind as well. The next step after that is azitamide, provided that the LDL uh, target is 20 milligrams per deciliter or less, because we know we're going to get a limited reduction from azitamide. So if they're within 10 or 15 points, we'll use azitamide. If they're not, we're going to try to go straight to PCS kinetin inhibitors, because we know that that's the only way we're going to get them to target. Sometimes payers force us to use azitamide, even when they know it's not going to work. The reason they do that is they think that eventually we'll just give up before we get to the injector. How about beyond HDL? Remember, HDL, marker of risk, not a target of therapy. Niacin, fibrates, and the CTEP inhibitors, none of them showed event reduction despite raising HDL. How about triglycerides? They're over 500, go after them. You can use statins, especially atorvastatins, very effective on, on high trigs, purified omega-3s, and fibrates. You want to look for secondary causes. And around here, secondary causes always start with alcohol and diabetes out of control. Often diabetes out of control, it's never been diagnosed. 
And often you're going to use combination therapy for very high triglycerides. Lifestyle helps tremendously. Weight loss and diet helps tremendously with triglycerides as opposed to LDL. And we've had some patients that can drop their triglycerides 90% without any medication when they put their mind to it. How about if they're on a statin and they're 150 to 499? Well, if they have vascular disease or diabetes, you want to use purified EPA because that's where the that's where the data resides. Uh, purified EPA, very hard to get, even in a generic form. Uh, and so we struggle with that as well, trying to get that to our patients. But if you have somebody with diabetes or vascular disease and they have high triglycerides after statin therapy, purified EPA is the only agent that's been shown to reduce events. I'll remind you all that the FDA recommends not using statins plus niacin or statins plus fibrate. In fact, they don't recommend using niacin at all as two large clinical trials, the AIM High trial and the HPS Thrive trial, showed absolutely no clinical benefit using, stat, using uh, niacin. So we do not use niacin in our clinic. With that said, uh, I think we can go ahead and open up to questions or concerns or comments or complaints. Um, no difficult questions, no double questions or, or convoluted questions. All right, Don, it's all you. Well, I don't see any questions in the chat. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and uh, send your question along or send it in the chat. We have a couple more minutes left. Well, it sounds like I have one question. Hi, this is Stina Wedlock. Um, so, given that we aren't supposed to use fibrates with um, statins, what do you do with those patients who are taking their taking their fish oil and purified fish oil and taking their um, maximum dose of statins, and we're still getting triglycerides up in the four hundreds? Well, if it's below 500, the guidelines say don't treat it. Uh, okay. So so if you're below 500, you know, so 500 is the arbitrary cutoff we put for increased risk of pancreatitis, uh, although no clinical trials have ever been done showing that any of our interventions actually reduce that risk, we feel that they do. So if if you have them on, again, purified EPA, not not the fish oil from the, from the carp that somebody ground up in a white river, but purified EPA, on top of statin therapy, um, you're not going to add a fibrate unless they're greater than 500. If they are greater than 500 in a combination, I'll usually come in a low dose pheno first, make sure the renal function is renable. Never use a combination of statin and, and gemfibrozole or lopid. The risk of myositis goes up 10 to 20 percent. Uh, no, 10 to 20 fold. I'm sorry, 10 to 20 fold, not percent, fold. It's a medical legal disaster. Was there someone else who had a question? Okay, I see one there. Where do you purchase purified EPA? What dose is recommended? So you're looking for four grams daily. And unfortunately, purified EPA, um, there is a generic maker of the of uh, purified EPA. It's, it's So you have to write a prescription for it. Uh, and you have the branded form that's still out there as well. That, that, and that's Vasipa for those of you kind of wondering what it is. Um, everything else that you buy is considered to be more of a supplement. Um, and although I, I shouldn't say that supplements aren't reasonably good, um, you know, they're not regulated in any way. Uh, and so when I'm treating patients, I try to use something that, that is available that, that I know is reasonably pure and actually has in there what they say is in there. So Many payers now are asking that you use generic purified EPA. Um, the problem is, is that availability, just like everything else, the supply chain issue there is, is limited. And it's not cheap because it went generic. But I don't use any store-bought fish oil because it's usually like, you know, eyeballs and tails and butts and stuff like that. Not really what you're looking for.
Well, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate all the information that you just shared, Dr. Kovacic, and I will get the slides into this message so that you all can have them. Um, if you have any other questions that might come along, feel free to send an email. We'll get them to Dr. Kovacic or you can find him on email. So thank you so much for participating tonight. Appreciate having you. Our next talk is going to be on atrial fibrillation on June the 9th. So thanks a lot. Hey, good night all.